Good morning. I'm sitting here in my normal seat. This is where I sit every Sunday in the first part of our service. The only thing missing here this morning is you, but we're so glad that you can join us online. And what we want to do this morning is join with Christians all around the world. All around the world today, people will be praising God. We want to do that as well. And to help us focus on that, I want to read some words from Psalm 148. Let's listen to God's word. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Let him praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above the earth and heaven. We're going to sing a song now. It's based on these words from Psalm 148. It's called, All Creatures of Our God and King. And after we've sung this song together, one of our church elders, Stanley Spray, is going to lead us in prayer.
Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can unite our voices and our hearts together as part of your church and pray to you this morning despite being physically in different places. Firstly, we want to praise you that we can call you our Father. And we're amazed that the great God of creation is personally interested in every single one of us, despite the many wrong and sinful things we do. You were so interested that in your great love for us, you sent your son Jesus Christ into our sinful world, where he took the punishment that we deserved and paid that price that you required for our sins. We praise you that because of his death on the cross, all our sins have been forgiven and we now have a relationship with you and we can call you Father. We want to thank you, Father, for your care, love and protection since our last service. Father, we cry out to you for help as we face this coronavirus. We ask that in your mighty power, you will stop its spread. We ask that you will give wisdom to our leaders as they take the necessary steps to slow down and contain this virus. We ask for your protection to those right on the front line who are caring for huge amounts of infected people. For all those from this congregation working in our NHS, Lord, we thank you for their dedication and courage and we ask that they might know your divine help as they in turn care for the sick and frightened. We also pray that in our church, those who are elderly are vulnerable. And if they're watching this broadcast, Lord, we want to tell them that we love them, that we're praying for them, and we are here to help them at any time. Father, in these uncertain days, we praise you that those who know Jesus as their saviour can rest on the promises in your word. You have said, I will never leave you or forsake you. We pray this morning that as Peter opens your word to us, that we might hear words of comfort and encouragement. Lord, give us receptive hearts this morning and help us to praise you, our loving Heavenly Father. Amen. Today is the start of Easter week. It is Palm Sunday today. Now normally, this time of year, we celebrate Holy Week services with the rest of the churches here in Carrickfergus. Obviously this year, we've had to cancel that. So to do something different, what we have produced is a series of online devotional videos for you to watch each evening. They'll be short videos. We'll post them live on our Facebook and our YouTube channels. They'll go up about five o'clock each evening, but you can watch them at any stage. And on them, there'll be a Bible reading linked with Easter story. I will do a short devotional talk and there'll be a prayer. And we really want to encourage you to engage with these. So maybe after you've had your tea each evening, you could sit down and watch them. Either if you live on your own, you could watch it on your own. Or if you're a couple, watch it together. Or if you're a family, we'd encourage you to gather around as your family with parents and children to watch it to listen to God's word, to think about the devotional talk, and then afterwards, maybe to read the passage again and to pray together, either on your own, as a couple, or as a family. Let's take this time in this special week, Easter week, focusing our hearts on our mind on Jesus Christ. Now, our first video will go live this evening at five o'clock. So look out for that, engage with it, and let it bless your heart as we think about Christ's death, his love for us, and his resurrection as well. Now last week with the children in the children's talk we were learning more about prayer. We were learning that when we pray to God we can confess the wrong things that we've done and as we thought about that we looked at a verse from 1st John chapter 1 and verse 9. Now I know that Anna and Saul Chambers have been watching our services at home which is great. Thank you for doing that. You keep watching each week as well. Now, Anna has learnt the verse that we were thinking about last week. She's memorised it, word perfect. And to prove it, she actually sent me a video of her doing it. So let's watch Anna in action now. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just 
to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John chapter 1 verse 9. Brilliant job, Anna. Now, if we were in church at the moment with everybody else here, I would ask them all to give you a big clap. We obviously can't do that this morning, but I want to encourage everybody else, give Anna a clap where you are at home at the moment. Now, I also asked the children last week to download a colouring in sheet with that verse on it, to colour it in and to send it in. If you sent it in, I would show it. I have been overwhelmed by the response. Lots and lots of children have taken the time to look at this verse, to colour it in and to send it back to me. So I said I would show them. So let's take some time now to do that. The first picture I received was sent in by Anna Courtney. Well done, Anna. Looks great. I also received a number from some of the younger children in our church. This one's from Joshua Liggett. Very creative. Love how he stuck things, stuck shapes on to his picture. Here's one from Toby Walsh. Very colourful. Great job, Toby. And another one from Seth Radcliffe. Seth is only in primary one. Excellent job. This one is from Faith Gray. I love the bright colours that you've used. Lily Ashfield coloured this one in. Looks great. The words really stand out. There's also lots of siblings who sent pictures in. This one's from Joshua Trimble. Joshua's only three. Thank you for sending this in. Looks great. And his brother Caleb has done this really colourful one. The Hazard household have been busy. Firstly, Sam. Now it says that Sam had some help, but that's okay, Sam. That's allowed. Also, big sister Amy has put the time and effort into this one. Looks great. And an even bigger sister, Rebecca. Brilliant job on your picture. Here's two more sisters. Firstly, Elsie Chambers. Super duper. And then your sister, Lily, as well, has done this brilliant picture. Here's two from my own girls. Firstly, Molly. Looks great. And then Ruby. Super effort on this one. And finally, we'll see if the best for last. No, I shouldn't say that. We have the Ramses. Here's Hannah's. I love the hearts on this one that you've drawn. And then Leah's. It's great to have some of our Connect Bible Study group send in their pictures and you've done a great job. But they're not the only members of the Ramsey family to send in a picture. I also received this one from Mum Cara. Cara, this looks great. And I hope that in these stressful days you find it relaxing to colour this in. But I must say I was a little bit disappointed that Dave didn't do one. Perhaps he couldn't find his crayons. But thank you to everyone who sent in a picture. They all look fantastic. Now, girls and boys, next week is Easter Sunday. It's a really, really special day. It's a day when Christians all around the world celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive. Now, that's the challenge I want to set you for next Sunday. I want you to think about those three words. Jesus is alive. I want you to be creative. I want you maybe to draw a picture, make a model, use your imagination, do anything that communicates, shows us, tells us this great truth that Jesus is alive. So if you do something creative, take a picture of it, send it in to me, and if you do that, I will show it next week in our special Easter Sunday service. Now we want to sing a song particularly for the children at this moment. It's one of my favorite songs. It's a song that we love to sing at CB Kids Sunday. It's called, It's All About Jesus. Now, the Bible is full of lots and lots of stories, lots of stories that you learn about at CB Kids, stories about Abraham and Noah and Moses, all these great Bible characters. But even though there's lots of stories in the Bible, all these stories tell one big story. And the hero of this big story that the Bible's all about is Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. He's the one who came to save, he came to rescue us from our sins. It's a great song to sing. There's brilliant actions that go along with it as well. I need some help with the actions, so Molly's going to lead us. She's going to show us the actions and join in at home as we sing together. out by you your spirit wrote through men like a pen in the hand of a god who knew that we would need to know how much you love us so you wrote it down for us forever oh, oh. from genesis to revelation there's one story of your great salvation it's all about jesus oh it's all about jesus shout now from every page there's one hero that'll save the day It's all about Jesus, oh It's all about Jesus 
say is she gets her moves from her father. Now we have come to the final week of our series working through the book of Joshua. We started it back in January and we've arrived here today at chapter 24. It's been a wonderful book to study together as a church. I know many of you have found it a real blessing and encouragement in your spiritual lives. Now last week when we were in chapter 23, Joshua stood up, he gathered all the people and he gave an address to the nation. We find a similar thing here in chapter 24. It's an address to the nation. And although it's Joshua who is the mouthpiece, it isn't actually him speaking. It is God himself who speaks to his people. And so we find these familiar words that you find throughout the Old Testament, where Joshua starts by saying, thus says the Lord. That's how the prophets spoke to the people. They started with this declaration, thus says the Lord. This is God speaking to his people. And what we find here in chapter 24 is exactly the same format that we found last week. It starts off by telling them what God has done. And then in response to that, it tells the people what they should do. Here's what God has done for you. These are all the things God has done in the past. Now, listen to this, and this is what you should do. This is how you should behave. This is how you should act in response. Now, as we have found throughout this series in the book of Joshua, the lessons that we find here in chapter 24 are extremely relevant. They're extremely helpful for all of our spiritual lives. So let's pause and let's listen to what God has to say, how God still speaks through his word. Now, one of our church members, Laura Kirk, is going to read chapter 24 to us now. We're reading from Joshua chapter 24. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river, and led him through all the land of Canaan, and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess. But Jacob and his children went down to Egypt, and I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it, and afterward I brought you out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. And when they cried to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and made the sea come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, and I gave them into your hand, and you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and invited Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Indeed, he blessed you. So I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the leaders of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And I gave them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, 
which drove them out before you, the two kings of the Amorites, it was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not laboured, and cities that you had not built, and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of the vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did this great signs in our sight and preserved us all in the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God, he is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are my witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and put in place statutes and rules for them at Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the terebinth that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us. For it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us. Therefore it shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. So Joshua sent the people away, every man to his inheritance. After these things, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in his own inheritance at Timnath Serah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountains of Gash. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. As for the bones of Joseph, which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried them at Shechem, in the piece of land that Jacob bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money. It became an inheritance of the descendants of Joseph. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him at Gibeah, the town of Phinehas, his son, which had been given him in the hill country of Ephraim. Thank you, Laura. Now, the chapter starts with God reminding his people what he's done. He recaps the history of Israel up to this stage, and he does it in four impressive sweeps. It can be summarized in this way. He tells them that he chose them, that he delivered them, that he fought for them, and he's blessed them as well. He starts by reminding that he chose them. Centuries before, he had chosen their ancestor, Abraham. Now, when God chose Abraham, you might think that he was a godly man, he was a righteous man, he was a man who was seeking after God, anything but. In fact, we're told here at the start of the chapter that Abraham worshipped other gods. He was a pagan, and yet God chose him. God set his love upon him. God took the initiative, because that's what God always did. He stepped into his life. There was nothing special, there was nothing deserving about Abraham or his descendants that would come, and yet God chose them, and he set his love and his affections upon them. Then secondly, God had delivered them. The children of Israel had ended up as slaves in Egypt. You know the story of Joseph, there was a famine in the land. They'd gone there, they became slaves. But verse 5, God tells them here that it's him who brought them out. He delivered them in a miraculous way. There was the plagues. There was the Passover, the crossing through the Red Sea. And God brought them from their slavery. 
and he gave them freedom. He brought them into the promised land. So he chose them. He delivered them. Thirdly, he fought for them. He brought them out of the land of Egypt, and he brought them into the promised land. They conquered it. And as he says here in verse 12, not with the sword or the bow. Yes, they had great victories, but all their victories, the source of power and strength behind them was God himself. It was God who had fought for them. So God chose them. He had delivered them. He had fought for them. And then fourthly and lastly, God has blessed them. Everything that they now enjoy in the land is because of the good hand of God. Let me read verse 13 to you. He says, I give you a land on which you had not labored and cities that you had not built and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. It was all a good gift from God. Now at this point, God actually stops speaking And it's Joshua's turn to take over. So God has spoken to them. He says, here's all I have done. And Joshua steps up and he says, now in response, this is what you must do. And we read about that in verse 14. Let's listen to God's word. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And so he expects a response from the people, and this response can be summarized in three words. Here's what he tells them to do. Fear God, serve God, and reject any false gods. Fear God, serve God, reject false gods. Now, fear the Lord is an interesting phrase. It just doesn't sound right to your ears, because often we think about fear, we think about being scared of something. Maybe you've got a fear of spiders, or in my case, it would be snakes. Is that the kind of thing that we sort of cow away in the corner, we're shivering, we're quaking at the very thought of God? No. Fear the Lord is linked with reverence. It's to put somebody in their rightful place. I'll give you a limited sort of simple example. Think about being back in school and the principal walks into the room. How do you act? How do you behave? Well, you're going to behave in a different kind of way because there's a respect for that position. Here is somebody who maybe make, will make you sit up in your seat and behave, change the way that you speak. There's a, a reverence for the authority and the position. Now, God is not somebody to be scared of. Maybe you were scared of your principle, but he's somebody who needs to be feared. He needs to be treated with the right respect. He needs to be put in his rightful place. And what is the rightful place for God? Well, it's the number one place. It's the central place. It's the the core of our lives. He should be the supreme person in our lives. And when we do that, when we put him at the center of our lives, we're fearing the Lord. We're putting putting him in his rightful place. So they're told to fear the Lord. And then secondly, they're told to serve the Lord. Now, later on this chapter, Joshua dies. But in verse 29, we're given this great description of him after his death. He's described as the servant of the Lord. Now, here's Joshua. What has he done for the last number of years? He's been the great leader of the children of Israel. He doesn't describe Joshua as a leader. It describes him as a servant because he knew what was the right thing to do. Although he was the leader, there was one greater than him. There was one who his life was in submission to his Lord and his master. And over his life, Joshua was somebody who faithfully followed the Lord. He was somebody who obeyed what God had instructed him to do. And that's what it means to serve the Lord, to faithfully follow and obey. Now, service demands commitment. In fact, it demands exclusive commitment. That's why Jesus in Matthew's gospel, when he was talking to people, said, You can't serve two masters. That's impossible. You can't be obedient to one over here and follow one over here because there's going to be a clash. And so that's what what Joshua says next to the people. The third thing he says is reject the false gods because you can't serve two masters. You can't fear and serve the Lord while you're running out after and obeying and praying to false gods. And so what you've got to do is get rid of them. Reject all these other gods. Give yourself completely to God. And we come then to the most famous verse in not only this chapter, but probably the whole of the book of Joshua. Part of this verse will appear in lots of people's homes, maybe up on a plaque, up on a a picture. Let me read verse 15 to you. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve 
whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What's Joshua saying down there? He's putting down a marker. He says, if you're not going to serve the Lord, well, choose which God you're going to serve. Pick another God. Maybe the gods of your ancestors, the false gods. Maybe the gods of your enemies, the Amorites. Pick one of those gods, but I'm not going to choose one of them. Me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And so he puts his flag down. He puts a marker in the sand as such to say, this is what we're about. This is what my family are about. We know what God has done for us. And so in the light of that, we are going to serve the Lord. And actually, if you unpack the grammar, which is often a dull subject when you talk about grammar, but it's really important here because the word that he uses here about for serving the Lord is in the continuous action. It's something that isn't just for a short while. It keeps on going. Basically, what he's saying is, I've served the Lord in the past. I'm serving the Lord now, and I'm going to keep on serving the Lord. It's going to be a continuous action because that's what it means to be a real follower of the Lord. It's just not a passing phrase. You know, like a New Year's resolution. Some of us think, oh, we'll turn over a new leaf here. We'll give this a go. A spiritual life, maybe we'll try that. I haven't tried Jesus. Maybe there's something in that. We'll do that. But it's like the New Year's resolution. We start off, we'll give it a go, but in the back of our mind, we know that it probably won't last long. Or maybe when times are tough, people turn to a spiritual phase. Lots of people are doing it at the moment with the sort of things that are happening in our world. We've been con- um, confronted with the truth that we're not in control as we thought we once were. We've been exposed to the frailty of human beings. That life isn't quite as it seemed, and that's got lots of people thinking. And maybe you're watching our online service because that's what's going through your mind. Is there something in this spiritual life? And so sometimes people come when life is tough, but when life goes back to normal, as it might do in a few months' time, when the coronavirus passes as such, well, that's something we did in the past, but we don't need it any longer. That's not what Josh is talking about. He's talking about something that keeps on going. And after he lays these expectations in front of the people, the people respond, and they respond with this great declaration that's recorded in verse 18, where they say, we will serve the Lord, for he is our God. We will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But then Joshua replies, and he replies with this unexpected twist. It's not how you expect the story to go at this point. Joshua turns around to these people, and you think he'd be delighted that they've made this declaration to serve the Lord. But listen to what he says in verse 19. He says these words, But Joshua said to the people, You're not able to serve the Lord, for he's a holy God. He's a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions, or your sins. Basically what he's saying to the people is, you've made this declaration, but you're not able to do it. Now what's he doing here? Why is he saying these words? He's 110. Has he turned into this grumpy old man? He's a pessimist. You're making that declaration. There's no way you'll keep it. No, actually what he's doing is he's challenging the people. He's challenging them to think about what they've just said. He doesn't want the people to make a casual response. And so he wants to make sure that actually what they've said hasn't just come from their mouths, but it's come from their hearts as well. He wants them to count the cost. That's what Jesus Christ said. In the Gospels, when there were lots of people falling and they were amazed at the miracles they did and they wanted to be associated with Jesus, Jesus says, no, stop. You want to be one of my followers? Count the cost. It's maybe not quite what it seems to be. You need to be able to take up your cross and follow me. There's going to be hardship and suffering here. So count the cost. Think about it before you make a proclamation of, or a declaration of following me. To use another kind of simple example, we think about what's often said at Christmas time when people get dogs as Christmas presents. A dog is for life, not just for Christmas. 
You know, maybe in people's minds, they think, oh, wouldn't it be cute? Wouldn't it be lovely? I've got a little puppy for Christmas, and I'd be jumping around the house, and be lots and lots of fun, and it's all very exciting for the first few hours, and then the reality kicks in. We've actually got to look after this thing. We've got to feed it. We've got to wash it. We've got to clean up after it. We've got to take it for walks, and there's a commitment involved. And that's a different story. And so what sadly happens to lots of these dogs and puppies, well, they're brought back to rescue homes. You see, a dog is for life. It's not just for Christmas. And what he's doing here is he's challenging them to think. Don't be flippant with your words. Don't make a casual declaration of faith to follow the Lord. Because are you able to do this? He tells them that God is a jealous God. Now, when we think about the word jealous, we think of negative terms. And there's lots of negativity with jealous. It's a, it's a sin if we're jealous for the wrong things. Maybe we're jealous about what other people have. That is wrong. That is sinful to do. But there is a proper jealousy. So actually spouses, a husband and wife in a marriage covenant relationship, should have a proper jealousy for that relationship. And so they don't want the other person the other partner in that relationship, to have a wandering eye, to be flirting round. No, they're jealous for their love and the affection of the other person in the relationship. What do they want? They're jealous for total commitment because that's proper. That's what it should be. That's the promises they've already made for one another. And then Joshua says to them, God will not forgive your sins. And that seems really strange. You know, we're coming up at Easter time. We think about Jesus dying on the cross for sins. He's offering to forgive us. Why would he not forgive their sins? Well, really what he's saying here, it's given a warning for continually rejecting God, for continually running after other gods. Because if you keep doing that, God won't forgive your sins. God will actually bring judgment, because that is true of God always. Yes, God is open-handed. He offers us forgiveness for our sins. He offers us forgiveness for things that we, we don't deserve, and yet there is a limit to it. There comes a point where God says, enough is enough. You've continued in your sin for too long. You've rejected me for too long, and now you face the judgment of God. And that will is something that everybody will face if they continually reject God's offer of forgiveness and salvation. And that's what he's saying here. If you run after these other gods, there will come a point where God will not forgive you, but instead judgment will come, and judgment will come, and you will be removed from this land. So he warns the people. But despite this warning, the people take it to heart, and they respond with a resounding declaration of commitment. We read about it in verse 24. Listen to these words. And the people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. They made this declaration. No, we're going to be like you, Joshua, in your household. We are going to serve the Lord. Now, thankfully, we're told that they were true to those words. We're told that at the end of this chapter, that even after Joshua died, they continued to fear and serve and love the Lord. Now, sadly, it didn't go on to the next generation. The next generation stopped. We read about that in the book of Judges. In fact, when we come into the book of Judges, it tells us that everybody did what was right in their own eyes. They had forgotten about following the ways of the Lord. But actually, the people here who made this declaration were true to it. They loved, they obeyed, and they served the Lord. Now, we have come to the end of chapter 24. We've actually come to the end of our series as well. And as we come to the end of this series, it's a good time to ask ourselves a serious question. It's good for me as the preacher to ask my heart this question, and it's good for you at home to ask yourself this question as well. What is your commitment to the Lord? What is your commitment? In the light of all that Christ has done for you, what is your commitment to him? Now, if you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, God has done the same four things for us that he summarized here in this chapter. God has chosen us, he's delivered us, he's fought for us, and he's blessed us as well. Let's unpack that a little bit. The Bible tells us if we're a Christian, God has chosen us. In Ephesians 1, it tells us that he chose us before the foundation of the world. Even before we were born, God chose us. He set his love upon us. Did we deserve it? Absolutely not. 
Not one of us can say that we deserve God's love and his grace and his mercy. We are sinners in the sight of a holy God. And yet by grace, not by any merit of us, he chose us. He set his love upon us. Secondly, we know that he delivered us. Here on Easter week, we think about Christ going to the cross. Why? Because he wanted to set us free. The Bible says we are slaves to sin. Sin is our master. Even the good things we want to do, we, we end up not doing them because we're slaves to sin. And Christ died on the cross, taking the punishment for sin. And he offers us forgiveness and salvation to set us free, to give us freedom, liberty from our sins. So he chose us. He delivered us. He fights for us. Do you know, as you live as a Christian, there are many battles. There's the flesh, our own sinful nature that wants us to continually do wrong. There's the temptations from the world all around us that wants to drag us down and go the wrong way from God. And there's the devil himself, the enemy of God, who wants to constantly trip us up in our Christian life. And so as we face these spiritual battles and temptations and challenges, we are weak and we are powerless and we need somebody to fight for us. We need somebody else's strength. Or as the Bible tells us about Jesus, well, he is this, our sword. He is our shield that through him we can overcome this world and all its temptations and all the spiritual battles as well. There's a song that we sing here in church. It's actually a song we're going to sing at the end of our service here this morning. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. And one of the verses in that song focuses on, in on this issue that as we go through life, there are struggles and there are battles, and we are able to overcome, not in our own strength, it's yet not I, but through Christ in me, the one who fights for us through the Holy Spirit who lives in our, in our hearts and in our lives. So Christ has done incredible things for us. He's chosen us, he's delivered us, he fights for us, and he's blessed us as well. That's what Ephesians 4 tells us. We looked at that last week. It tells us that he has redeemed us. He set us free. He's forgiven us. He's adopted us. He's brought us into his family. He's given us this eternal inheritance. He has blessed us in many, many ways. And as we think about that this morning, as we think about the truths that come out of Joshua 24, what is your response? What is your response to what God has done for us? Can you say like Joshua, I will serve the Lord? Or can you look at your family, maybe who's sitting beside you as you watch this service today, and can all of you with heartfelt feeling and truth be able to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? Who today is going to say, I will serve the Lord? In the light of all that he's done for me, this is what I'm going to do. With wholehearted, continuous commitment, I'm going to fear the Lord. I'm going to serve him, and I'm going to reject everything that's false, that's not of God, anything that's a hindrance. For some of you watching, you need to start serving the Lord. Yes, you've maybe got a spiritual interest. That's possibly why you're watching this service today. You're maybe thinking about spiritual things, but if you're true to yourself, if you're true to your own heart, you know that you've never really put God in his right place in your life. Maybe he's one of many things, or a passing interest, or something you're seeking after. But he's not in the supreme place. He's not central in your life. You're not fearing the Lord, putting him in your right place. You're not obeying the Lord. Maybe there's bits of the Bible you obey, but it's not wholehearted commitment. You're not a true follower of Jesus Christ. You've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior. You're not walking in obedience to him. Well, then today you need to start, and this is a great day to start. Start by serving the Lord, trusting him as your Savior, and start living for him not just for a day or a week or a passing phase, but for the rest of your life, because it's the best way to live. For some of you, you need to restart serving the Lord. Yes, in the past, you've made a commitment. You've prayed a prayer. Maybe you've been baptized. You might have even become a member of a church, maybe even our church, Carrick Baptist. But something's going wrong. Other things have crept into your life. That affection you once had for Christ has, has faded. 
and you're not living your life the way you should. And so today is the day you need to start, restart serving the Lord, seeking forgiveness for those sins that have come in and ruined that relationship and start walking and following the Lord in the right and proper way again. And for some of you, well, you're walking well with the Lord. You are serving the Lord. You're following him and you're obeying him and you're being a blessing to many people. You're being a blessing to many in our church family as well. Can I encourage you? Keep on going. It's not just for a season. It's not just for part of your life. You don't take sabbaticals. Church life might have closed down and the things that we do here in this building, but that doesn't give you an opportunity just to switch off in your spiritual life. No, like Joshua of old, make that declaration. I will serve the Lord. No matter what situation in life, no matter what troubles and trials, this is the best way to live. So I will serve the Lord. And as you think about that this morning, and as you think about your commitment to the Lord, let's pray. Let's pray and ask God's help to help us to serve, to fear, to love, and to obey him. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you that you're a great God. We thank you, God, who's done incredible things. At the start of this Easter week, may it warm our hearts again as we think about your great love for us. That you came to die on a cross. Your son, Jesus Christ, died on a cross for our sins and rose again and offers us the greatest thing, forgiveness for our sins, a relationship with a holy God, and eternal inheritance as well. And so in response to that, May each of us, with a heartfelt commitment and sincerity, say, I will serve the Lord. That we would put God in the rightful place. That we would love you with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. We are weak, but we know we have a, you give us a strength to live for you, to obey you, and follow you. Help us as we do this. And we ask all this in the mighty name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to close our service here this morning by singing a song, a song I mentioned a few moments ago, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. This was recorded a few weeks ago by three of our members, Karen and Kyle Ashfield and Emma Miller as well. They knew we wouldn't be able to meet here in normal service and to sing the way we normally do. So they've recorded this song, especially for our service today. Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
no fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid, for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the I want to thank you for watching today. Can I remind you to watch later on as well as we start our Easter devotions. They'll go up online right about five o'clock today and then every day all the way through this week up to Easter Sunday. If we can be of any spiritual help, do contact us. Contact us. You'll find contact details through our website or the Facebook page. Or if you need practical help in these difficult days, if there's any way that we as a church family can help, do get in touch. But let me close this morning with these words, these words of benediction, this doxology that's found at the end of the letter to Jude. Let's listen to God's word. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.